All right there folks, this is Dan Pagel here with CLV Boost and in this brief CLV Boost tutorial we'll be talking about membership sites and constructing a sustainable subscription based business model no matter your niche or industry. So by the end of this video not only will you have a pretty solid idea of how you can apply a subscription based sort of rebilling uh, business model into whatever uh, niche you, you operate in today, but you also learn how to avoid the most common errors that I see made in the particular domain of membership sites. Uh, at the present time, I'm running a business that's about a, a quarter million dollars a month uh, in the self-protection and fitness space, um, and I've, I've coached and, and advised uh, subscription-based software companies as well as other folks in the information marketing space who've gone from, from nothing to, to five figures a month. Um, six-figure businesses, seven-figure businesses, uh, mostly around the single topic of subscriptions or membership-based online recurring business models. The kinds of business models that I tend to favor. If you want a, a business model that's going to have a higher valuation for sale, if you want a business model that's going to be more reliable in terms of its returns, and if you want a business model that, in, in my personal perspective, tends to scale well, this is why people like software, software as a service, that is, um, then a membership site in the information marketing space or the instructional space is about as good as it gets. Um, although there are many a pitfall that folks fall into, um, and my job is to help you avoid them. So, again, we'll go into um, some of the, the, the key tenets that will sort of make it work, if you are to make it work, and some of the core pitfalls I'll want you to avoid. So uh, first and foremost, we'll talk about, before we talk about anything about what's inside of a membership site, we'd have to talk about what validates paid content in the first place. If you're, if you're selling educational material uh, in the age of YouTube, uh, you better doggone have a reason. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, content by itself has relatively limited worth um, due to the fact that you can go on Google and, and look up whatever you want these days. So uh, with that being said, if you want people to pay for content or pay for some kind of a membership-based program, um, the the best modes of, of doing so that I'm aware of uh, involve the following. So the first of which is, is niche specificity. So uh, in, in some domains, you may be able to, through your own expertise or through a particular focus, dial into a particular need within your niche or domain farther and deeper than other folks in that particular space can go. So, for example, you might teach a particular kind of aromatherapy, and, and I believe that there is a relatively broad market for that. Uh, a friend of mine actually consults uh, a client who runs a seven-figure aromatherapy business of all the things in the world. Um, so if, if you... If you um, uh, teach or profess a very specific type of aromatherapy um, that maybe has a particular kinds of benefits that really appeals to a particular market, you may be able to knuckle that down so long as all of that isn't easily findable with a single Google search. Similarly speaking, um, if you teach, let's say, um, you know, how to sell, uh, you know, roofing or floor covering, that might be niche enough to the point where you might be able to validate some degree of a membership site by, by mere specificity alone. Uh, presumably there's a lot of material out there on how to sell. Uh, selling is, is a very desirable skill and, and sort of has been you know, since probably before the advent of currency. Um, but if, if, you, if you specifically teach people who sell carpet and sell tile and sell linoleum, if you specifically help them sell to homeowners and businesses in, in, and you have very contextually relevant, unique, niche-specific approaches there too, then that may in fact warrant some degree of niche specificity and people may be willing to pay for that because it's rare, it's unique, and it's particularly dialed into something that they care about. Okay, So this is one way of validating paid content. You, you don't just put articles behind a paywall and say this is a membership site. Uh, that, that's, that's not a, a great strategy for a legitimate uh, sustainable business model, um, so niche specificity can sometimes warrant that. In addition, we have curriculum or consumption. What do I mean by this? Curriculum or consumption. 
Um, although the, the, the world of Google and YouTube can give people information rather quickly, it doesn't exactly tell them how to use it. So you may in fact not have something so specific that people can't find it on YouTube, but you may teach it in a particular curriculum and in an order that makes sense for people to learn, that makes it digestible, that hopefully uh, makes them adhere to actual behavior change in improving their skills, and is better than if they were just given the universe's bucket of all the internet content and were forced to sift through it themselves. So in one of the businesses that I run now in the self-protection space, um, when we teach self-defense skills online, while a good deal of what we are teaching may be able to be found in different places, although we don't give away uh, the totality of some of those instructional programs for free online, uh, but similar uh, types of techniques may be taught. Uh, the, the virtue and benefit in many regards is the fact that it's constructed in a curriculum with week by week and month by month uh, action steps that are intended for, for folks to follow along to. Similarly, we've got uh, community and coaching. So, and there's, there's pros and cons to this, and we'll talk about this briefly, but community and coaching, YouTube, you know, uh, the, the comment section of YouTube videos are not exactly the best coaching environments, uh, pretty close to, to the same degree of, of um, you know, horseplay as you would see in Reddit or, or some other online communities. It's not exactly a friendly place and you're probably not going to get fantastic advice. So if, if you're able to offer community or coaching on some level within a membership area, then that often can validate uh, paying for content because the content is being created for you in the sense of supporting your particular goals, answering your particular questions. And so in that sense, coaching community might might be something that's that's unique. There might be value to the people, not, not just the coaches who are teaching, but to the rest of the people that are in there aiming to learn this same thing where you can all learn from each other and there's, there's a, a benefit to be gleaned. So um, in terms of what kind of content you can use, ultimately the choice is really yours. Really video tends to have the highest uh, perceived worth. So if you're going to have a membership site and you don't have any videos and you're, you're just selling the ability for people to have access to articles, uh, unless you're selling financial information or um, uh, some kind of, you know, unless you're uh, Elsevier and, and you're selling um, medical journals to doctors, um, written articles in and of themselves have a, a rather low perceived value in most contexts. So if you have a membership site without videos, you're probably in trouble. If there is to be a single staple of content types inside of a membership site, uh, across those that would be successful and even those that aren't, uh, video would, would be um, the highest perceived value that you could get to. Throwing in audio and written content is can be great, um, particularly if it bolsters or, or uh, helps to accentuate the benefits of whatever you're conveying in video, but video tends to be the richest and tends to be valued the most by folks. Um, next up, are you basing your membership site on personality or are you basing it uh, or, or are you speaking from the voice of a company? Um, often a solo founder, and I, I had done this in an earlier business myself, uh, will, will base the programs, the content, the membership area, or what have you, um, around the, uh, the knowledge of whoever was the founder of that particular um, business. So it, it will all be about access to this one particular guru. Um, the, the upside to that is that it's, it's a relatively low-hanging fruit. When you are, quote-unquote, the guy doing the marketing, building the relationships, the person who's the expert, so to speak, um, it, it feels relatively simple to base the business model on you. The downside there is that you're not really building a scalable or saleable asset. Uh, you know, Tony Robbins may be pretty close to a billion dollars in net worth, um, but he can't really sell Tony Robbins Corporation to that many other people. This is completely not me knocking Tony Robbins, by the way. I have very large amounts of respect for Tony Robbins, uh, and, and, and I think he, he deserves it in, in, in a vast number of regards, but at the end of the day, it's going to be difficult to sell that company. So uh, whichever your choice here will sort of dictate a good deal of your future. If you if you do eventually plan on having the option of selling your company, and I think it is nice to have the option, then I tend to lean in, in uh, a non-personality specific membership site. Member engagement. So there's pros and cons to member engagement. 
Uh, if you have a membership site with only 20 people signed up to it and you have a forum, uh, you can almost guarantee that it is going to tank. A lot of membership sites in today's day and age uh, have a kind of group that gathers on Facebook. So they have a Facebook group that is part of the, uh, the membership interaction because people are on Facebook. They're not actively logging into a membership site on a regular basis and going onto a forum. Even if you had 1,000, 2,000 paid members, um, forums are difficult to build for free, never mind when they are paid. So uh, uh, not an impossible challenge to overcome, but member interaction is often rather difficult at the get-go. So if you have a very uh, high engagement group uh, and you have enough of them um, to really start getting the ball rolling, then that may in fact be the case. I, I would never venture into the domain of making your membership site dependent upon member engagement and the value in member engagement until you can seed a certain number of members who maybe you know personally to actually get an ongoing consistent conversation happening within this member area by themselves and then if they can keep that up by themselves, a couple dozen, two dozen folks, maybe three dozen folks uh, who you can sort of reach out to personally, only then would I sort of open it up to the rest of the membership and actually make it happen. Uh, unwarranted sort of live components and interactive components, uh, when the interaction just isn't there, it will be more of a harm than it will be a good. Uh, so it's something to bear in mind. Do you want a buffet or do you want modular releases? This is another factor to consider when you're composing a membership site. Do you want people to uh, sign up for your membership program and instantly have access to the totality of your library and then anything new that you add, they're just getting on top of that? Or do you want to open up particular sections of the material month over month or week over week or however you want to roll out your curriculum? For the curricular approach, modular releases often works well. This tends to be what I do because I don't like to continuously have to create uh, membership content. I like to build a succinct curriculum that gets rolled out across all new customers. Um, and, and it's rolled out as a particular kind of experience. It's designed in one particular way. Um, and it, and it, it implies that once I've filmed you know, 14 months worth of material or once I've paid other people to film 14 months of material, which is my preference, um, then no additional content need be made. And people go through the 14-month program um, without the need to create any additional uh, content. That's one extreme. Uh, that, that, that's been built out in a very explicit way because my, my objective is to sell that business and the more sort of ongoing legal work implied in the membership site, uh, presumably the, the less perceived value of the membership site to an acquirer of that business. Um, so I tend to lean in the modular releases uh, side of things. However, if you have an engagement heavy audience, you can make, you can make membership interaction work. Uh, buffet may cut the mustard um, because giving them access to everything at once and then if you're constantly adding new material that may be exciting, enticing, and interesting enough um, to not require the anticipation of the next module, the next module, the next module.